Welcome to the ACS Technical Advisory Board podcast series, where we talk all things tech including data, cyber, AI, blockchain, and Internet of Things. Meet your host, Dr. David Cook, Vice President of the Australian Computer Society's Technical Boards. David is a technology advocate dedicated to advances and progression of computing and human-computer interaction. In this episode, David will be talking with John Baird on the topic of cybersecurity. How do large organizations handle cybersecurity? David and John discuss Super SaaS and how do organizations integrate a new way of thinking in terms of modern cyber preparedness. John Baird is a valued member of the ACS Cybersecurity Technical Committee. He's a person who has a passion for getting the job done, and his weapon of choice is technology. Today, we're going to see how that translates into best practice for cybersecurity. John, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, David. Lovely to be here. So let's start with the hard stuff, talking about cybersecurity to boards and senior managers. Why is it so hard and what do you need to watch out for? Yeah, there's no surprise that lately boards and senior managers have become a lot more aware about cybersecurity and what they need to be doing. One of the things I found, there's two important aspects when you're talking to particularly boards. Uh, One is the language, but the second is the model. I was in a situation recently where I talked to a board about backups. Now, I can use the word backup. Everyone understands the word backup. But without the same model in the minds of all of the board members, the word backup means different things to different people. To some, it means shuffling tapes. To some, it means shuffling floppies. To some, it means online replication. So when you're talking to people and you use a word to the board, you have to make sure that there is a common understanding of what that word really means and a common mental model and understanding. Let's talk about software as a service. Now, for many, that's a way of life in the tech industry, but in cyber terms, it's a bit tricky. You use a term called the pathway to super SaaS. And just explain to me, what does that mean? And and what's it likely, how's that likely to impact on companies and supply Mm. chains? Mm. So I use the term super SaaS to talk about organizations transition to almost the whole of organizations SaaS. Organizations have adopted SaaS in the past and what they've been doing is to say, we will shift this piece of software out to a supplier, we'll shift that piece of software out to a supplier. And quite often the glue that puts them together is the humans. The process lives within the organization. A human will log into one platform, uh, do some operations, connect to another platform, do some operations. When you start moving into what I call super SaaS is when you start stringing those together with APIs so that A human may initiate the first operation in the system. Then through a series of APIs, data is pulled out, pushed into the next system. Pulled out, pushed into the next system. I've seen these with over a dozen operational steps in them, going through different platforms for transformation, each one doing something slightly different. When you get to that stage, the entire business flow can live outside the organization. All you're doing inside your company is shifting data in and out. Now, when it comes to cybersecurity, that makes the world very different. All of a sudden now, the data lives outside the organization. You may keep a copy internally, absolutely. The actual operating part sits outside the organization, is outside your control. You don't know what they've augmented it with. You may not be privy to what the third party has done with that data. So you really need to understand your suppliers. You need to understand your contracts. You need to understand the legals. Any one of those suppliers in that 12-step process goes down, the entire process stops. And now you're in a position where you're reliant upon a supplier to fix it. That puts you at the mercy of the suppliers. That means you need to have a good relationship with them. It's a very different world from simple occasional use of SaaS that we've had to date. Uh, I have one client who uses super SaaS almost exclusively, and they have to form very close, very detailed, very comprehensive relationships with all of their suppliers to make this work. We know other companies who simply can't list all their suppliers. So the transition from not knowing who's doing what to actually knowing who has your data, who's doing what, and how they fit into your business processes is quite a journey, and it can't be left to happen haphazardly. So super SaaS sounds tricky because it's about doing what companies don't want to do, and that's by putting more people back into the equation. Absolutely. And as you've just said, if it's a very large organization with many, many different third-party arrangements, that becomes very, very not just tricky, but but unwanted from a company perspective. Yeah. What's the solution to getting for, for large organizations for trying to rectify that problem? So there's two parts to that. 
One is how do you rectify the past? And the other one is how do you plan for the future? Uh, I work with organizations to help them try and establish better cyber resiliency, which is not how do we stop things from going wrong, but when things do go wrong, how do we get back on track quickly? It's not something that can be fixed overnight. It's a process that you have to go through and it's a mindset. If you build it properly and you integrate it into your business processes, it doesn't have to come with a lot of overhead. It doesn't have to come with a lot of cost. Do it right. Do it once. Do it when you want board people. I guess it's fair to say that a lot of people take on SaaS because it's easy. Um, it's, you know, from a price perspective, you know what you're paying for um, and uh, it takes the pressure off the company. Is there any kind of hesitancy in terms of the, 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 the sort of the... Um, uh, I guess the way in which companies think about this, do, are they, do they, is the right culture in place to get this kind of change in place? Absolutely. The reasons you outline are a lot of the reasons SaaS is being adopted. One of the other big drivers as well is that you are shifting your operations from a particular function out to generally the owner or the manufacturer of that function who knows it far better than you ever will. Right. So when there are problems, they've got the right team of people to try and restore service. On the flip side, it does involve a lot of trust of a third party. These days, with the number of breaches happening, with the number of problems being reported, boards sometimes have difficulty accepting that they're going to have to trust these third parties and that their organisation can suffer financially, reputationally, regulatory from the actions of a third party. So there is a mindset there about how do we get boards and senior managers comfortable with what's going to be happening and the trust they need to build up with these third-party suppliers and trusting that the people right through the organization understand this and are actually managing those relationships. Sometimes a particular supplier just won't be able to deliver what you need and you will need to change suppliers or simply agree that you're not going to get it. Now, they're difficult conversations and an organization needs to be strong enough to have those. Let's uh, let's talk about uh, regulatory change. Now, at the moment, we've We've had so many different data breaches. We've had so many different incidents. We've talked about the need for change. I just wonder, you know, where? what's your view in terms of the, the need for regulatory and legal change? The change is creeping through, although it is now going faster than, um, faster than it was. We're seeing quite a few changes in quite a few areas, and I think they're not necessarily always as coordinated as they should be. We'll start to see lots of overlaps. Um, organization saying you must do this and another organization saying you must not do this. Uh, it will be interesting to see how that plays out. But right now, for me, the changes to the privacy principles uh, are going to be one of the biggest changes that are coming through. There's 116 uh, promoted changes coming through. Uh, and probably buried in there, one of the bigger ones is the Privacy Act used to apply if you had more than $3 million in revenue. Uh, they're looking at removing that or at least reducing it. So there will be a whole lot of organizations who skated through life thinking it just doesn't apply to us, who all of a sudden are going to be hit with the full gamut of the Privacy Act and will suddenly have to rethink a lot, a lot of their business processes and how they work. That's a big change for people. Now, you can either do it on the basis of looking back, how do I fix this? Or you can do it saying, looking forward, how am I going to remain compliant? And if you build it looking forward and you build it around resilient principles, you'll end up with a much better solution. So that's great. And looking at, uh, in terms of the Australian privacy principles from an Australian perspective, that's one way. When we take into consideration things like the GDPR and the changes that that's brought about, because they've been more, I guess, at the leadership side of things than Australia has, yes. then, you know, is it the case that it's obviously we're slightly different? Is it the case that we need to align with them or is there room for them to change? Are we looking at a global change or is this an Australian phenomena in its own right? I think Australia is catching up. As you said, we were behind the ball to begin with. Uh, we're now looking to catch up. I think we should be heading towards some global standards. Uh, I think GDPR, maybe with some nuanced flavours, but makes a very good base for us to build upon. It would be very sensible for Australia to look at what can we adopt simply out of GDPR. That makes it much easier for us to um, share services, share data centres, share all sorts of things if we know that their suppliers are all following a common set of standards. So, John, thinking about the need to change standards or at least acknowledge, um, I guess more securely acknowledge those differences in standards, is this a phenomenon that you see taking place in the next three months, six months? Is this something that's, uh, you know, the next six years? What, what, what's the time frame here? Because 
we we talk about the impact from these things in very in very urgent terms, mm-hmm. but we don't seem to have the same urgency in terms of the regulatory change. Uh, absolutely, I don't think we can afford to wait six years. Uh, I think in three months we'd probably get more of a knee jerk reaction. We need to find some middle ground there. One of the difficulties with technology, if you think back to the dot com boom of the two thousands, uh, all sorts of promises were made. And within a year, everyone was saying technology can't deliver, and it was all a big boom. 15, 20 years later, we've delivered everything we said we would at 2K. It's just this change takes longer than people are used to thinking of. And what we're going to find now with these regulatory changes is two things. One, they will need to take longer to get through everybody's psyche, to get baked into processes. It's a lot of change for organizations. But on the other hand, they need to happen as quickly as possible to protect people. Finding a balance for that is a very tricky thing to do. John Baird, thank you for your time today. Thank you. To find out more about how the ACS is powering Australia's technology brilliance, visit us at our website, Facebook or LinkedIn. Want to get involved with the ACS technical boards? Email us at tab at acs.org.au and tell us a bit about yourself. Join us for more thought leadership, ideas and information through our other podcasts on the ACS YouTube, Facebook or on LinkedIn.